Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon. John Suntress here. I'm getting ready for Rose City in Portland this weekend. Can't wait to see everybody. I hope to uh, say hello to you if you're going to the con. A couple show notes. I know commercials can be annoying. Uh, please listen to the commercials at the beginning of Word Balloon if when you download them you hear them or if when you're playing them live. That's how I get paid. One of the ways I get paid. I don't get paid if you fast forward through the commercials. And uh, there's a portion of the audience that does fast forward. So please uh, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It's only 90 seconds to two minutes of commercials before we get to the meat of the show. I really appreciate it. I also have a YouTube channel under the name of Word Balloon. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. I'm trying to get to at least 1,000 subscribers. I'd like to put more video content up there. There's already dozens of files at YouTube. Uh, again, it's under Word Balloon. Questions or comments about the show, reach me via email, john at wordballoon.com. Okay, almost set to go. One more commercial, and then it's off to Word Balloon. Thanks a lot for listening. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, reaching back in the archive for a great conversation between Ed Brubaker and Greg Rucka. This is from uh, 2012. It's a live conversation with an audience. Uh, it doesn't, you know, every now and then when I put out a convention panel, some people are like, yeah, it's too echoey. I don't, I don't like it. I can't understand it. Um, no, I disagree, but uh, that's okay. In this case, I was able to plug into the sound system directly, and uh, the audience questions are great. The, uh, the panelists sound great, and it's a discussion of uh, crime comics with Ed Brubaker and Greg Rucka from Emerald City Con back in 2012. Ben Saunders, a fantastic moderator. Man, uh, I, I always demure to uh, the great British voices of comics, and Ben is certainly one of them. At the time, Ben was an associate professor at the University of Oregon, knows his comic book history, uh, did a tremendous job directing this uh, discussion that became very freewheeling. Now, again, this is 2012, so at the time, uh, Greg is working on Stumptown. This is uh, early years of Stumptown. Good timing with uh, Stumptown premiering on ABC with Kobe Smulders at the end of the month. Man, I've been so impressed with the promotion for that. Ed certainly uh, doing a lot of great crime, crime comics as well. This is when Criminal was happening. He had already done Sleeper for Wildstorm. Uh, they talk about, of course, Gotham Central in detail and their years doing that. Uh, the crime elements that were in their superhero books, like uh, both of their runs on Batman, Daredevil for Brubaker, uh, Batman's No Man's Land back in the late 90s, 1999, 2000 with uh, Greg. Greg also wrote the novelization of that. Greg also discusses several of his crime novels. Uh, and they get into a conversation about the history of crime comics in general and what influences from that period of uh, the 40s and 50s that influenced uh, their modern day work. I love this conversation and I'm happy to represent it to you now on Word Balloon. All brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you greatly, League, for your support via Patreon. It's a new month, and uh, man, I've got new uh, Word Balloon subscribers. I have a feeling that uh, Publishers Weekly uh, article that uh, was done last week, or I should say, excuse me, The Beat, Heidi, Sand uh, Heidi uh, McDonald's uh, great website. Uh, Matt uh, O'Keefe did a nice uh, piece about comic book podcasts and had a nice little mention of Word Balloon in there. It was from last uh, Labor Day last week. So if you haven't checked it out, please do so. And uh, new subscribers, new listeners, thank you very much for joining me here at Word Balloon and subscribing to Word Balloon via Patreon. You don't have to, it's free, but if you if you like what you hear and you want to support the cause here at Word Balloon, like I always say, is Word Balloon worth the price of a comic book a month to you? Is it worth a dollar a month to you? If you can swing it, um, you're helping out the cause, and I thank you greatly, uh, League of Word Balloon listeners. You can go to patreon.com slash wordballoon, subscribe there. You go directly to the Patreon page, uh, on the front page of wordballoon.com, there's a uh, Patreon ad with uh, an old picture of me when I'm slim and nice. Uh, <laughs> click on that, and uh, it'll get you to my Patreon page. I'm trying to get back to that fighting weight as soon as I'm done healing from this uh, leg injury that I had at the end of the year. But thank you very much for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Hey, Aftershock is no stranger when it comes to, comes to uh, crime fiction. People like Garth Ennis doing incredible crime books for Aftershock. Uh, they've got also uh, great people like Cullen Bunn and um, Chris Sabella, to name a few of the crime creators at Aftershock. You're going to find every genre represented in a great way at Aftershock Comics with tremendous creators, not only the aforementioned, but also people like Marguerite Bennett and Tim Seeley and Cullen Bunn, as I said, and... Um, 
gosh, I mean, so many great uh, people that I really respect their writing and their art, and we're seeing incredible uh, genre-bending stories that mix crime sometimes with the supernatural and other genres as well, and it always makes for a nice mixture that uh, makes unique stories and compelling stories from Aftershock Comics. I've been talking to a lot of Aftershock creators. I will continue to do so in the weeks ahead and give you more discussions about the books directly. But you don't have to wait. You can go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on their books on how to order those through your local shop at aftershockcomics.com. All right, let's get into it. Man, this was uh, seven years ago at Emerald City, my one visit to Emerald City. I had a blast. And um, Joseph Hedges, one of my Word Balloon listeners, uh, is like, hey, man, you should like record this panel. And I'm like, well, but I'm not moderating it. So real quickly, you know, Ed, Ed and uh, Greg were friends, and I'm like, is this cool? They're like, yeah. Ben Saunders I had never met before. I'm like, Ben, do you mind? Not at all. Okay, great. So uh, it's been a while, and I know, like I said, I've got a bunch of new listeners that maybe you never heard this great discussion, so I represent it now. Ben Saunders moderating, Ed Brubaker, and Greg Rucka, a discussion about crime comics, their own, and the history of the genre, right here on Word Balloon. We are lucky to have with us today... Um on this crime panel, the two men who, who are, in my opinion anyway, um, the very finest exponents Absolutely. of this Thank genre, uh, Ed Brubaker and Greg Rucker. <laughs> Thanks. Suck it, Azarello. <laughs> Actually, I dinged him yesterday in my Wonder Woman panel, too. So I kind of like Brian's work, honestly, really. It's, it's, I'm going to get a reputation. Um, well, I, I have prepared here um, some uh, CV history for both of these gentlemen, but obviously you guys know how cool they are already. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip all of that. Um, although, if you aren't reading um, Stumptown and Criminal, then what is wrong with you? Um, you really need to be doing that. reading Fit Yeah. Um, so, uh, I will just dive in with a first question, and um, we'll see how far we get, and then um, perhaps get some questions from the audience uh, at uh, the last ten minutes or so. So, crime comics, as we all know, are going through something of a resurgence right now. Um, but obviously, in terms of sales, this just can't compare to the, the big boom of the Golden Age, 1942, 1954 kind of period. Now, neither of you obviously are old enough um, to have read any of that material when it was coming out. But what I'm curious about is uh, a lot of it was reprinted. Those classic EC titles have been reprinted many times. And more of it is being reprinted now. So yeah, my course is doing Crime Does Not Pay. Crime Does Not Pay and the... Simon and Kirby crime yeah. stories have just come out. Yeah. And, of course, there's a bunch of European stuff becoming available now for the first time, too, which isn't Golden Age, but mm-hmm. I will fold that into this question. So um, what kind of impact, if any, did the Golden Age crime stuff or does the Golden Age crime stuff have on your crime comics? You go first. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spit. Um <laughs> No, uh, well, Johnny Craig was was a real big influence on me. I think as a kid, I I had a friend when I was a teenager who um, had a lot of the EC libraries because he worked at a comic store and would get them at half off or something. And um, when I got to Crime Suspense Stories, it was like a light bulb flashing, you know. And and you know, I was a teenage sort of you know. Gumbag criminal. So this was, this was uh, clearly like, oh wow. But I just, I also loved that you know he would do these six or eight page stories that were basically like a little Alfred Hitchcock movie or mm-hmm. something. And and I I loved his art. And I saw so many people who were influenced by his stuff, like Jim Aparo or you know a lot of the guys who worked on Batman. You could see a lot of Johnny Craig in their work. And um, I think he's you know. I think Miller so, cites him as a big influence, actually. Yeah, a lot of these, you know, he's one of those guys who influenced all the guys you liked, but you'd never, unless you, you know, could buy a $500, you know, mm-hmm. hardback collection, you could never actually see his work. Um, but that was, a, that was a big influence on me, and it was more of, you know, getting a copy of Seduction of the Innocent and sort of seeing all the stuff that made comics get, like, banned that was like, oh, wow, you can stab someone in the eye. And, you know, like, like that, that was but you, but you, fairly impactful. But you, but you still can't have sex. 
What? You still couldn't have sex. In yeah, you couldn't have sex. It's, it, it's interesting. The only know. penetration was injury to the eye motif. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's true. <laughs> the only penetration you could do was violently and bloodily. And, um, you know, I just did an intro for one of Dark Horse's Crime Does Not Pay um, uh, anthologies. And they're doing these lovely reprints. And if you're interested in crime comics, you should definitely pick these things up. But one of the things, and I realized afterwards, like, my intro was this very pseudo scholarly intro and then I read like the intro that Fraction had done and so on and it was far more personal and you know and gleeful but I was looking there were there were like three separate stories where and the whole thing with crime does not pay if you don't know the comics is that crime is an entity he's sort of this you know ghostly figure who appears and then they do these sort of true crime bios at the beginning so they'll go like you know here's the story of Lucky Luciano and and crime appears and says, yes, he was one of my best students. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you get like this bio, and then there would be a series of other stories, some of them clearly based in fact, and some of them quite clearly not, but presented as based in fact. And then there would be some, um, you know, basically, you know, old myth and, 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 and material like that. And there were like three in this story where I was reading, and the, the, the element of sexual deviance that was implied but never spoken of, right? Like the guy who goes on the long revenge kick because the woman he was in love with was kidnapped by this other evil guy, and she dies literally off panel. You never find out, right? I mean, it's just, it, you go from one, you know, then he went to prison, and then he got out, and he was burning with revenge, and oh, she had died after being held in a cave by this guy for two years. <laughs> and... I'm reading it, and I'm like, whoa, I mean, wait a minute. The story here is not about this guy. The story is about this incredible evil. Yeah. They just, you know, it, it, it's far easier in those comics to talk about, you know, well, and then he stabbed him in the stomach and pulled out his entrails. It's like, <laughs> as opposed to, no, he kidnapped this woman. He repeatedly, brutally raped her or whatnot. There is, it's an interesting juxtaposition because especially in crime does not pay, they are presented as being, and this is pre-Wortham, yeah. they are presented as being cautionary tales. They're being presented as stories saying, don't be a criminal because of these horrible things. But by the way, this is how Lucky Luciano did it. And, <laughs> and there are other stories in there that's like, you know, don't do this, but this guy actually had a great freaking life. Yeah. Um, and then they don't, like I said, they, they just, they, it, I found it, it is an interesting cross between what they were pretending to sell and what they actually were selling because you know as a 40 year old guy reading this and, and how to put this you know as a liberal arts major I know how to read a text right but that doesn't mean I'm the only guy who was like wait a minute stuff was going on off panel here now, everybody reading it knew what was going on that titillation factor was huge, and I think it goes well, actually was, it goes back to work. Yeah. That's exactly what set him off. Well, yeah, because he was working at those clinics in mm -hmm. Harlem and stuff, and seeing little five year old kids reading these comics, mm -hmm. which they shouldn't have been, no. probably. Right, but they were always aimed at at least twelve year olds. Yeah, so, so <laughs> ten maybe at the. But if, if you look at the movies of that era too, a lot of the crime and uh, there's so much implied in the movies of that era too. Yeah. So it was that was the era of like sort of dancing around what you're actually talking about. Well, and, and even the real highbrow. I mean, you look at double indemnity you never really see anybody in bed with anybody but there's a whole lot of screwing going on. oh yeah you yeah. know um other otherwise yeah um i for me i didn't come to it I, honestly the ec stuff scared me as a kid I, I was i was put off by it um i am not a horror fan and so the line between crime and horror was really blurred um what i was into was you know, Gibson's Shadow. Mm -hmm. um, I was into the, the pulp heroes that are very dark. I mean, if, if you've read them, I remember listening to uh, one of the Orson Welles Shadow, you know, radio plays, and I distinctly remember there's a moment in it where a submarine is forced to surface, and everybody comes out on deck, and they're all machine gunned. And I can remember being like eight or nine and hearing this and being really horrified by the fact that all these people just got murdered. <laughs> And it was like double-digit body count, you know? And you hear like the chaka chaka chaka, ah, ah, 
just splash, splash, <laughs> splash. And I was just like, oh, my God. You know, how's the shadow going to stop them? Please hurry. <laughs> um, the I shadow's did. just waiting for them to be done so he can <laughs> come in and shoot the last guy and take I, all the credit. I didn't actually get into crime until... Um, it, cr- I got into crime outside of comics. I mean, that was my approach. I, I, I was reading a lot in genre, but they were novels because that's what I was writing. And then when I started doing comics, I sort of naturally was like, well, let's do crime stories. And then I honestly think one of the <coughs> worst or, and or best things that happened was Ed and I met up, you know, yeah. at a conference one day and said, hey, you know, Gotham Police Department. Yes, Gotham Police Department. Let's do a Gotham <laughs> Police Department thing. And then, you know, for me, that was we're off to the races. No, no coming back. So. Yeah, I mean, I got, I got here by... Like trying not to have a career in comics, sort of was like <laughs> Shelley Roberg, who is now Shelley Bond, was like really after me to do something at Vertigo, and I kept like pitching ideas that kept getting shot down because I was trying to pitch a Vertigo like thing. And I said, Well, none of this stuff is really stuff I really want to do. And she said, Well, what do you want to do that you think we won't do? And I wrote up Scene of the Crime like that afternoon, and it got approved like two days later. I was like, oh, crap. The fastest turnaround, <laughs> like, <laughs> fastest yeah. turnaround in Vertigo's history. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and, you know, and then, yeah, and then from that got hired to work on Batman and met Greg. And every time we'd sit down, we'd just talk about how we wish we could just do the comic about the cops and not have Batman in it. We actually, there were some big fights to get that book done. Yeah. It was actually because ours Jeanette. was successful that we were able to get it well, greenlit. Well, you remember being, we were in, we were in a, a, a bat summit they used to do I don't know if they still do them I know at Marvel when they do a summit now they're like 500 people and they're sealed in like a bubble that was, and that was the summit to... where there was supposed to be a blizzard that never arrived so yeah, the entire right. New York City was vacant and we were at like the 80th floor of this like building. the Time Life building yeah and, and I could look out the window and see the old DC building uh-huh. was 666 Fifth Avenue yeah. like nobody ever noticed that yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when they're you more know. than missed that one yeah um, <laughs> But the 666 at the top of that building is in giant red, red I mean, really, so I, was like, <laughs> I kept listening to these inane Batman conversations and, thing, and looking out the window and just seeing 666 on <laughs> uh, this cold, like, See, what I re- See, what I remember about that was Carlin, who was um, editor-in-chief at the time, was sitting in on it. Yeah, he was pushing us to call it Gotham and, and Murder City. Oh, no, he wanted Batman in the title. Oh, that's right. And we were sitting there, and we had finally got, I mean, we had gotten to the point where we were like, no, we could do this book. And, and we had turned and said, look, Powers is working. We can do this. And, and we want to call it Gotham Central. And it was like, well, no, you have to call it Batman Gotham Central or Batman Gotham. The, the, the Gotham Police or something like that. And then Jeanette, because Jeanette was still there, yeah, Jeanette came in. in. She wanted in to go, well, how's the meeting going? Yeah. And immediately we were like, we want to do this, but no, we no, want no. to call it Gotham Central. I sketched the logo. <laughs> I sketched a logo and drew like a police badge next to it. And, and we said, like, Gotham we, Central, we're yeah. going to call it Gotham And, and she she's said, like, oh, that's that. fine. That's great. And out she walked. And we're sitting there looking at Carlton going, we went. Yeah, it's, it's always nice to go over the editor in chief. Yeah, side. well, they love it. They they do. But you know, when the publisher walks in and yeah. the editor in chief is being dim, yeah, you, you do what you have to do. So I miss those days, though. Really? What dim editor in chief? Well, just that, that, really that era of do you DC. Really miss them? No, not just not hugely, but. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I hear I hear from more people who read Gotham Central now than when we were doing it. It's insane. I've, I signed more Gotham Centrals this morning than anything else. Yeah, uh, it's, it's it's nuts. Do you guys read Gotham Central? Have you read it? Thank you. I would just like to go on Alan Moore kind of record that if they ever do more Gotham Central without no, <laughs> <laughs> they might do a prequel. Oh. oh. <laughs> Sorry. Chuck, Chuck Dixon would say they already did because he did like five other Gotham Central like books before we yeah, got there. Yeah, but they weren't. Nobody cared. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the next well, question. Well, was there a question <laughs> actually? You've actually, you've actually you, you started to talk about um, discovering crime through other genres, and that really is my, my next question. Because um, I think a lot of people discover the crime genre through prose novels or through the movies. Yeah. Um, and well, a lot of contemporary crime comics, they read to me like movie treatments, you know, please make my movie, as opposed to things well, that needed to be comics. A lot of comics read like that. Yeah, a but, lot of... But your, they do. Your crime comics... Strangely, none from Marvel or DC. 
<laughs> who have movie studios. But, um, but, but your comics read uh, like crime comics. They needed to be comics in order to tell the story. Mm-hmm. So I was wondering if there's a, if you would could give us some examples of um, how you think the crime genre um, changes or it particularly works. In the comic between book prose form. and, and or yeah, film in terms and of as you know, the difference between writing crime for a comic as opposed to writing it for a film treatment or uh, in a prose work, if you can think of specific examples in your own work where you you well, paced something or plotted something in a certain way, knowing it would be a comic. Well, well my first yeah, crime yeah. comic was when I was still writing and drawing <coughs> my own comics. I did a series called Low Life, and my second issue was the all crime, the true crime issue, which was my life of crime, and detailed you know all my stupid you know. Yeah, I stole, you know, recycled, recycling bottles out of someone's garage when I was eight. And, you know, just sort of going through up until the point of, you know, me and my friend committing an armed robbery when we were strung out on drugs. <laughs> and, uh, and getting lucky enough to, you know, not go to prison, get on with life. But that was sort of, that was my first time doing, and I realized, like, while I was writing, I'm like, this is super fun to do. And then, <laughs> like, to do, to write a crime comic instead of, because I'd been, you know, wanting to get into comics more and thinking, oh, what could I write? What could I write? And, and then Eric Shanauer and I did a crime comic together for Dark Horse uh, that was about two kids in Guantanamo Bay in the 70s. Accidental and, death? Yeah. And so I, I sort of, always was just using that bent because I read more crime fiction and watched crime movies and I wasn't interested in superheroes really. It was I had been interested in superheroes as a kid but literally I got to the end of Watchmen and I was kind of like oh, that's like the last superhero comic in a way that you need to do. And I, But I still always loved Batman. So it was because doing. Batman's not a superhero. Yeah, comic. exactly. Batman. Or it was wasn't to us. Yeah, yeah, to us, we just did a crime comic with cops and you know, was, I mean, crazy, that was, that, crazy bad guys. That so. was how I got the. the I mean, the, the initial approach to Batman for me was somebody coming to me and saying, "We well, had done Whiteout and saying, if I thought you had any interest in writing Batman, I'd suggest you talk to Denny. Yeah, Denny O'Neill." And my response to that was, "Of course, I want to write Batman." And the person I was talking to said, "Really." I wouldn't have thought you were that interested in superheroes. And I was like, I'm not, but I love <laughs> private eyes, and he is the greatest private eye in the history of literature. He never um, takes a client. He just solves all the cases. That's right. <laughs> His client is himself. Yeah. <laughs> um, Gotham is my client. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, my parents like, are my clients. No, stop, <laughs> stop talking about it. I want to go back to D.C. No. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> um, it's weird because I think for me, I, I was actually kind of taken. <laughs> I still am somewhat surprised when people go, "Oh, you write crime," and I go, "Do I?" Oh, I guess so because crimes happen. I'm not sure what defines crime as a genre, right? Because I came into professional writing wanting to write private eye novels, right? And the private eye novel, by definition, requires crime. <laughs> you can't. But what are you investigating? I lost my keys. You know, there's, there's got to be a crime related to the theft of the key. Um, I lost my keys. That's you know. a great crime. There you go, right there. That's, well, that's, I lost them versus zero, somebody. That's the zero them. effect. Yes, that is the zero <laughs> effect. That is the zero. Now, it's funny. I was just thinking that, too. I was like, I lost my keys. Wait a minute. That is the whole damn movie, isn't it? Which the zero effect is just uh, Nero Wolf. No, the, the zero effect well, is, Nero scanalimbo, Wolf. is scanalimbohemia. It's oh. Scandal and Bohemia but meets, it's got the meets, Nero, meets, meets Archie yeah. Goodwin. Okay. Um, uh, if I'll, you haven't I'll seen this movie, this is one of the most underrated, underseen, underappreciated movies. I'm a huge Holmes fan. And um, even if you hate Ben Stiller, you know, and even if you hate Bill Pullman, um, yeah, I think it's a fantastic movie. You, you should see this film. It's, it's a wonderful love letter to Holmes. Um, and Daryl Zero is a brilliant interpretation of that type of character. He's so dysfunctional, it's fantastic. It's amazing. Um, and I like, I like my genius detectives barely able to function. Yeah. <laughs> um, otherwise, you know, I'm not interested. I would never go see Dr. House. <laughs> God, no. they, they almost always kill the... They, they come yeah, this close to killing exactly. every patient <laughs> before they figure out, oh, hey, the problem oh. With, That problem with that show is the formula, but... Yeah. Uh, that's, well, that'll be a whole other panel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Greg and Ed on Dr. House. <laughs> on, on, on how House failed us. Um, <laughs> but no, so, you know, I went, I went P.I., and, and, and P.I. led to reading Thompson and stuff like that and, and, and exploring more deliberate crime but you know I was uh, you know I, I came up on 
Robert B. Parker Spencer. That was the stuff that was floating around in my house. Um, so I came to crime rather than through crime, through mystery. Um, yeah. And I discovered very on, early on, and if you've read Whiteout, you can see this in action. I discovered very early on, I can't write a mystery to save my life. I can't do it. I st- <laughs> stink on ice. There is no mystery in Whiteout. People go, oh, it's a mystery. It's like, no, it's not. I tell you who did it in the first issue. There is actually a moment where you see Furry screwing with the evidence. If yeah. you cannot put two plus two together at that point, it's going to take Carrie another three issues before she comes back around and says, hey, you screwed with the evidence. <laughs> um, I don't write a good mystery. And the way, the way around writing that is instead you write crime. You don't try to have a mystery. What you do is you try to you go to a procedural, really. Yeah. And that forces the POV to limit. Um, and it gives you a certain freedom to be able to drop things in and go, okay, well, then if I do this and this and this, I know where I'm going, but I'm not sure how I'm going to get there. I mean, a great example is the Mad Hatter story that you did in, in, in Central, which is you knew it was Hatter. Yeah. And you can, you know, I remember when you were working on it going, no, no, I wanted this and I, and I want Harvey, and how am I going to get there? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Tell us the mystery that you find out is why. Yeah. You know, but that's like, I, I love mysteries. Because I, I felt like I learned everything about how to be a good writer by reading Ross McDonald novels over and over again. Okay, well, yes. And that was the, the thing that clued me, and I was writing stories based on my own life, and I realized, like, Ross McDonald wrote, like, 40 Lou Archer novels, and every single one of them is the same story, yep. and it's all about Ross McDonald. Right, but... but okay, but now, the, but now we're talking broader genre. Yeah. I mean, do you ever read P.D. James? you ever read any P.D. James? Uh, every P.D. Uh, James novel is sure. the same. I mean, they're all the same. You can go oh, through yeah, them. Yeah. Okay, here's the person with their he- hidden, hidden homosexuality. Yeah. Here's the disenfranchised communist, right? Here's the dysfunctional married couple, and, and there's always a doctor or, or, or a nurse. There's always somebody who's like, I like my scalpel a little too much. Um, <laughs> and, they, and they're the same. It's over Peter and over. And we all do it. I mean, yeah. uh, every writer does this. We come back, and we have tropes, and we have... We have things that we're trying to work out, and I think a lot of the time we don't even realize that's what we're doing. Um, it, it took me years. It took an interview, somebody coming to me and saying specifically, what's going on with mothers, fathers, and their daughters in your books? To which I said, what are you talking about? And they literally came through and they listed every one of my novels. And they're like, so dead mom, daughter, dad issues. Dead that mom, daughter, true. Ash. Like, yeah, did it, did it with Kate. Yeah. Um, that's like the crystallization where you're like, oh. Yeah, well, Kate, Kate, Kate was sort of the, the, the actualization of everything. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's like, you get it's down, like we're get done with this now. We can, it. we can yeah. go somewhere else. So. That was like my, uh, my Archie Grows Up story in Criminal. Uh, <laughs> take everything that I've done in all my books and jam them together. Like, what if Archie was the talented Mr. Ripley? I think... <laughs> I still think that it would, that would have been even better if Archie had published it. Oh. Yeah, but then I wouldn't have made any money. <laughs> uh, and I'm yeah, not touching gotten, it. And I would have gotten sued. There you go. <laughs> but that's an example precisely of a comic that, that, that a crime comic that, that only works as a comic. Were, only works as a comic that in was, some ways. It makes reference to this larger. Yeah. Well, that was me, actually, because I. You know, when I, I write, I'm a comic guy. I grew up writing and drawing my own comics. You know, in high school and junior high, we would make Super 8 films and stop motion and stuff. But film was so expensive to develop, and I could just buy paper and draw. And so I always, I just ended up following that comics path and, and you know, and then ended up writing comics instead of drawing comics. I wanted, when I was a kid, I wanted to pencil X-Men, you know. And so... Uh, well, of course you did. You know, of course I did. <laughs> and I didn't even like them. I was like, that's the, that's the job. Um, but, uh, but no, I just, I sort of ended up there through, you know, I loved Johnny Craig's comics. I loved any crime comics I could get a hold of. But you'd look at what's on the racks and there wasn't any, you know. And so it was like, well, this isn't viable. And I wanted to do comics. And I just sort of ended up stubbornly ending up in comics as a crime writer but I never necessarily looked at any of the stuff I was doing in Criminal until that story as I couldn't have written this as a novel instead it's just this is what I do this is my market this is this is my thing I'm I'm curious actually so did you see I I would imagine you did but I I never follow numbers so did you see like a, a, a big bump in the reception to Criminal and your crime work post um 
the Captain America and Daredevil stuff? I mean, did, did well, those two feed each other? Did did, think, did you get a crossover? I think so. I think uh, there was, you know, because Sean and I had I done seen the crime, which hadn't been a, you know, hadn't set the world on fire, and you know, the trade came it out. Critically. And, it, yeah, it it it, it, got, it put my name on the map for sure, and got me you know the Batman gig, and 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 Gotham Central had done well. Okay. I think Gotham critically Central critically acclaimed, horribly selling. I think I think now they would consider it a really good selling book, but you know because <laughs> we we sold consistently like twenty thousand every time, they'd probably kill for that. And the artist never had to call us up and read to us from a screenwriting magazine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I waited for you to be drinking. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> But, but like, we had done that. No, the artist so, would call us up about other things. <laughs> yeah, I'm working with him now. He's great. He's got a lot of notes. Um, <laughs> questions, I should say. <laughs> um, I love Michael. Actually. Oh, Michael's I'm fantastic. so happy to the be working with him. The thing that Michael would say, and he said this to us multiple times on Central, he'd be like, oh, it takes you guys like a week at the most to write a script. I spent 30 days on this thing. So he would. There would be times when he would call us up, and he'd be like, "This doesn't make any sense, guys." Oh yeah. And we would immediately get defensive because you know the worst thing to say to the writer is your story doesn't work. Yeah. You know, and we're like, "What do you mean? This is a thing we finished two weeks ago. What are you talking about? Yeah. We're done. We're yeah. on. Yeah, we're done. We're done." Yeah, and he would be like, "Yeah, but you said this person is here, and this person is here, and then this person did it, and they couldn't have done it." And there would be these long pauses. Yeah. And then sometimes, if we were really stubborn, we'd try to dig in and be like, "No, you're wrong, and here's why." There was a taxi cab in the background, yeah, and that yes, one found, it, you just didn't draw. Yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> see, just, but just because you're but he ruining would, our comic, it, don't blame us. Yeah, <laughs> he would always be right. It was actually kind of awesome because you had a you had the benefit of of, of, of Lark's talent, which is enormous. Yeah, and then he was sort of ghosting our editor. You know, yeah. <laughs> so, well, it's always working with Michael is like having a third editor. Yeah. On the book, I, same thing. So sometimes on, on, you want to punch him, yeah, because you're like, I've taken enough notes already, dude. But yeah, it's like you take two out of ten, and then those are the two that are like, yeah, you're right. Dakota yeah. North couldn't have gotten there in time. Yeah. You jerk. I hate you. It's like, I guess I need to invent a new character. That's right. Oh well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I uh, so I done. You know, I did Gotham Central with you, and then you know Michael left because of myriad you know internal conflicts and. And uh, that just did everything. You go first or did you go? First? No, he went first because of the contract bullshit. Yeah. Where they were. Well, yeah. we can't talk about that publicly because we're too polite to tell you to tell you how DC ruined our comic. Let, um, let's put uh, that we way. wanted to do DC for the rest of our and lives. Michael Lark were unable to come to an agreement about how much he should be paid for his work, and thus Mr. Lark felt it was necessary to go somewhere where his efforts would be valued appropriately with remuneration. And he had just had a kid. That's yeah. always a nice time yeah. to ask someone to take a, a, a demotion. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah. So that just sort of once we lost Michael, it was like we were like this little. Yeah, we like, we had literally just done like an interview about how we wanted to do this book forever, and then suddenly and then, like, oh, well, there's Michael, and then he's over at Marvel, and my contract was up, and they offered me Daredevil with Michael, and I'm like, yeah, see you, Greg. I will. <laughs> but I stayed. So you know, I stayed as long as I could. Yeah, it was, just never, it was never. It was, we did Dead Robin. We did Dead Robin. We but Dead Robin. Um, you know, we still had this sort of classic. I love that we ended the book because mm-hmm. people were always worried the book was going to get canceled, and it was never going to get canceled. They no matter they couldn't figure out how to promote the book. They didn't know it was a tweener. It wasn't Vertigo. It wasn't DC. Batman book. It Batman's not sell, in it. It didn't sell as well as they wanted, but it didn't sell so badly that they could justify canceling it. It still sold better than everything Vertigo was publishing, yeah. except for Fables. Yeah. No, and Dan, <laughs> you can say a lot of things about Dan DiDio, and many people will, but, but not not us. But one of the things, <laughs> one of the first things he said to me when he when he came in at DC was he said, "I'm not going to cancel that book." Yeah. Because that book goes until you want to leave it, until you guys are done. But I'm not going to cancel Central. But after Ed left and Michael had gone, I was kind of looking around. I was like, this is not going to be Gotham Central anymore. And briefly toyed with the idea of trying to bring in another writer. But it was like, it's, it, it, it was not going to work. At that point, the only choice was to I am to irreplaceable. Well, honestly, <laughs> honestly, for that property, you guys yeah, were. Yeah, no, we, we and were. And that's not, that's not to di- well, yeah, diminish was... the con- contributions of Kano or, you know, Stefano or yeah, anybody no, no. else. Yeah. It, it is to say that that book from the start was you, me, and Michael. Sometimes and you, put it lightning, stopped, you get lightning in a bottle by accident. Yeah. And, I mean, we waited for Michael for a year to yes, start we that did. book. So it was we like did. we knew what that team needed to be. So I think what happened when I went to Marvel... 
Michael and I did Daredevil. I had just come off the big Death of Cap, which was like yep. at that point the biggest selling comic of the decade until they did that Spider Man with Obama in it. <laughs> Obama. Um, <laughs> It was an eight-page backup story. How dare that's, you steal my record? And that's a plot to a mystery right there. Yeah, that is exactly. a motive. You just heard motive. Yeah, guys. exactly. <laughs> Obama. Um, I voted for him. Uh, <laughs> Somebody in the back's dialing the Treasury Department. Yeah, right now. Um, big, 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 big fan. I know he's a Conan guy like me. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but I think coming off of that was like Sean had just done the Marvel Zombies, which was like Marvel's biggest selling mm-hmm. other book besides the Death of Cap, and I was like, perfect time, let's launch our crime book. We're at the highest profile we possibly have, and I think we were able to, you know, we launched out of the gate with Criminal pretty high, and then we always sort of maintained a pretty steady, you know, Gotham Central esque figure on it. That's what I'm you know, which at that point I was like, well, if I can get all the people who are reading Gotham Central to read a book that's not owned by Marvel or DC, that's a pretty significant That's called thing. win. Yeah, that's, that's called winning. And it's like, okay, well, that's enough people if they just are buying our book and we own it and we get, you know, and I can, you know, that's actually a good number for an indie book. So we were sort of able to stick with that for a while. And, you know, we'd lose a little bit as more and more trades started coming out. You'd start to get the trade waiters. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but then the trades sold real steadily the whole time so I felt like okay I'm at the biggest publisher in comics I have the biggest profile I'm ever going to have with an artist with the biggest profile he's ever going to have let's go do something that no one wants yes and, that was the and, time to get and, that was the time to have our way yeah exactly and it, and it worked and you know and we just kept building and building and now you know Fatal you know just by going over to Image where it's like well we only do this stuff we're not the little sideline of a giant publisher it's like being somewhere that this is because I don't think with Gotham Central it's like the same thing like Bob Lane told me this is my favorite book DC has done in ten years, yeah, and, I and I'm like, and and they put Aquaman on the cover that month with his water hand, yeah. And I was like, wait, we thanks, could have actually, previews. we yeah. could have actually used the previews cover to sell Gotham Central because it's yeah. a weird book, but it was like a thing where you know, uh, uh, now, now, I now, mean, now we're a, talking about the nature. Yeah. Of the, you're talking about the, the nature of it's and, of how and, to sell crime comics. Well, and it's, <laughs> and it's, and, well, it's, it's 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 how to sell anything. Look at John Carter, you know, and, and yeah. the marketing. Kerfuffle there. I mean, it's, you know, it, I like that movie. Yeah. Everybody I know who's seen it loved it. It's it's a great movie to take eight year old kids to. Yeah, apparently, well, it might it'd be like it'd it. be like the Star Wars of their we generation. Are now so far off. Yeah, <laughs> it's a crime Did that John Carter didn't me? make more money. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, so I whatever. I was here. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. But yes, okay. To answer your question, the yes. answer was yes. <laughs> Just to, to wrap it up. Twelve minutes, guys. Yeah. Not bad. <laughs> I do have a, before, before perhaps we should take some questions from the audience. I have a, oh I do God. have a question about genre, which is sort of related to what you're talking about—the difficulties of, of moving crime books in an art form which is dominated by the single genre, singular genre of superheroes, which I like. Um, but um, who doesn't? <laughs> but there, the, there are ways in which the crime genre and the superhero genre get criticized in similar ways as being predominantly uh, for boys um, and trafficking, trafficking in more or less unsavory male fantasies, power, um, uh, central characters who hold themselves to an unlikely moral code. Uh, in the midst of a corrupt universe. An unlikely moral code or an unreasonable moral code? Uh, you, you pick. And, and, <laughs> usually, and villainy often emblematized by a sexually seductive but untrustworthy woman. Um, so I'm wondering about how self-conscious you are about those conventions of the noir and crime genre when you do this work, when you try to avoid them, when you deliber- or do other times when you're going to deliberately play with them. Mm. Can I swing at this one first? Because yeah, I've actually been thinking about this a lot. Um, <laughs> because there's, I've got my new novel comes out in May. Um, it's called Alpha, and it is a bunch of guys with guns running around chasing other guys with guns. And for the first time in many, many years, I've written a novel where um, I found because I really was writing to a type of story. I wanted, I wanted to take. Um, a, a kind of sort of military procedural suspense thriller genre and then really r- uh, load it with as many cliches as I could 
and then try to break them. I mean, it really is. It was me going like, okay, he's retiring in three days and he's bought a boat. Um, he's got a sidekick who's black. Um, the, 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 the female character is sassy. Um, I mean, it really was. It was, it was I had a list of cliches and, and was trying to sort of go, how, do, how can I fracture this? What can I do? What can I do? And turns out the guy's not really black. <laughs> well, and a woman. What, what, <laughs> what I discovered is really, really hard to break some of them. Really hard to break some of them. Alpha is the first novel I've written where I am not really happy with the uh, w- with my female characters in it, uh, in particular. And because of the nature of the genre, the tropes of the genre, trying to be accurate to the genre, um, almost all the female characters were marginalized, um, and trying to make them more active and bring them in. And again, it's, it's, it's a genre, it's a trope-filled genre where women are almost always placed in jeopardy um, or are, you know, or are, uh, they, they're never agents of their own story. Um, Sleeping with the enemy. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's rather, and I, you know, I, I've identified, I, I've always identified, I mean, there's not a point in my career where I can say I wasn't. I've always identified myself as a feminist writer. I mean, I, I, I like writing strong female characters. Wait, what? I know, shocking, <laughs> isn't it? Um, and so, yeah, it's always something, I mean, it's always something that I'm, I'm considering, simply not only for, for, you know, my own political agenda, whatever that may be, but also, frankly, from a dramatic point. You do a PI story, and your detective is a woman and not a guy. You have just taken an established genre and gone, flip! Yeah. You get to do new things with it, because you can play the exact same scene that you've seen 50 times, but that scene now has different undercurrents, there's a different subtext, there's different articulations. There's the scene in Stumptown when Dex goes to see Oscar, right? <clears throat> and that's a complete... If, if that had been a guy, mm-hmm. Oscar would not be going, hey, look at me working out. And he wouldn't start by saying, yeah, put some put some you know bass over that shiner of yours, you might be hot. Mm-hmm. You know, Dex's response to him is an entirely different, and, and, and it fits in, in genre. You know, any other PI is going to look at this guy and be like, yeah, right, tough guy. Yeah, it's like the difference between, uh, but, what's his name on Justified and Karen Sisko. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like he doesn't, nobody hits on him when he goes to. When he, yeah, yeah, when, when he goes to do his job. No one wants to tussle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, it, it's something that I think is, it, it, from a writing point of view, you know, it's always active. Mm-hmm. But... I don't, I've always felt that, you know, writers make choices. You have to be cognizant of the choices you are making, and you have to be cognizant of how those choices can be interpreted. You can't control the interpretation ever, but you can certainly, you have to take responsibility. And I hate it. I mean, I really do hate it when when writers in particular go, no, I don't. I was just telling a story. It's like, you know what? Okay, but you put it out there in the world, and that means you own it, and you have to own what you're saying. And even if, and that means if you said something you didn't mean to, you own that. It means that you need to defend, you be able to defend and argue what you did say. I mean, I really do believe that. Well, but there's a difference between creating a character and putting your own views down. I mean, you've written some oh, yeah. reprehensible things that happen to women in your books. <laughs> yeah, and I've been, and I've been accused of being sexist for in, doing that. Yeah, that always drives me crazy, like... I always I started you know one of the things that early in my career was I did the comics like I was doing Dead Enders and Catwoman, mm-hmm. which were the books that the did, comic fans' did, girlfriend did. really liked, you know. And I was like, we didn't have enough comic fans that had girlfriends at the time. <laughs> <laughs> now it's better. <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> thanks, ladies. And ladies. And ladies. <laughs> women. Um, but uh, but like for me, I always have just thought I'll just write stories that interest me. And I have a lot of women friends. My best friends in my life generally have tended to be mostly women. And I, you know, I wanted to write comics that didn't offend my wife, you know. And and also, you know, like in Catwoman, I, I had her sidekick and, and her girlfriend be main characters. And it was like I just wanted to have a lesbian couple in the comic because two of my best friends at the time were the lesbian couple who lived upstairs from me. And I just wanted to put them in my comic. Mm-hmm. And, like, nobody ever gay bashed them or did any. It was no, there was no after-school special moments. And I was so glad that I won a GLAAD award for that, for just 
mm-hmm. an honest, accurate, because not every gay couple has yes. bad well, shit happen to them. Well, like, no, no that's not every the couple has a, you know, has a miscarriage mm-hmm. or, you know, not, not, no tragedy befalls everybody. And I was just like, let's just have it be like they're just regular people. Oh, this yeah, just well, happens well, to who uh, they are. Let's have it be like, like they're regular people. Well, in a yeah. comic book, well, but, I mean, but no, that, but that's exactly. exactly I mean, it was it was coming at the era where like it's Judd had to do his like issues of his very after school special issues, <laughs> and they were after school special issues. And it was it was a huge thing to be. No, I'm, yeah, I'm with no, you to, was, to sit there and say character is gay. It's not about the fact that they're gay. Yeah, I mean, exactly. The, the greatest thing about Kate in Batwoman is that she's queer. Who cares? Yeah, exactly. That is so secondary to the character. Yeah. Uh, you know, by the time you're through Elegy, it, is, it, it matters as much as the fact that her hair is red. You yeah. Know? And, I, which I'm still offended by. Yeah, well... Uh, <laughs> but, 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 but that's <laughs> always been... That, that's a different problem. Yeah. Well, also, I wonder if in a way, though, um, with superhero comics, there's a whole different trajectory and history when it comes to queering characters. I mean, in a way, you know, superheroes have always been gay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, said, you said it. So, you know, yeah, but I agree. You know, my, my, I mean, you know, when Wortham got this, he was upset about it in a way that we don't have to be, but yeah. when he said what he said about Batman and Wonder Woman in the 1950s, this was a long time ago that people were pointing out yeah. there was something a bit queer about superheroes. Yeah. The but crime like, genre in the way that little kids are, like, little, like the five-year-old boys can walk around with their arms around each other that they can't do when they're 15, you know? Yeah. Like, I think asexually... <laughs> More. Well, I mean, well, yeah. but, but, you know, yes, I don't know. But, yes, like, I don't no. think I don't, I mean, I don't look at Aquaman things. and Aqualad and immediately go, "Oh, they're doing." Well, right, no, but, I mean, but, that, like, but that, but, but that, they are kind of gay. But that's not the point. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, like, just put in, like, you know. I mean, you're talking about. <laughs> look, you, you remember? I, I wrote the No Man's Land novelization, right? And there was a moment in the narrative where Barbara Gordon is writing in first person and she's trying to describe the relationship between Dick Grayson and Bruce Wayne between Nightwing and Batman and I had written they're kind of like brothers and they're kind of like husband and wife and they're kind of like and DC editorial came back and said you absolutely cannot say that (laughs) and I was like what, that they're kind of like brothers and they said you know what we mean (laughs) and you know, I, I, I fought. I actually fought that change and lost uh, yeah. rather dramatically. Yeah. But <laughs> the, the thing is that you know, it's it, it's a valid interpretation of the relationship in the same way that you look at any of these things. You can read them however you like, and and to try to again, but when when you get a corporate entity, especially trying to prevent you from interpreting their work anyway, they're doomed to lose. Well, it's yeah. also a failure to understand that one of the best things about superheroes is that they're kind of queer. That's, that's not a, it's not an insult. It's well, and, and, and that it's open for that and interpretation. And the biggest, the biggest successes in that genre sort of revel in the weirdness of the whole... Like, Dark Knight Returns is the weirdest... You know, it's mm-hmm. like that scene with him and Catwoman. It's like the suits make it better. Like, <laughs> like, there's some there's some weird stuff going on there. So, but with with the crime conventions, I, I want to come back to this question yeah. of how of how you play with with the more potentially disturbing conventions of that genre. I mean, thinking particularly in your work, Ed, you have I presume this is you as well as Sean working on those covers that are obviously oh, yeah. loving recreations of 1950s, 60s, mm-hmm. and even 70s crime paperback covers, yeah. which have a particular set of, of visual tropes that always involve you know, a scantily clad woman who is either in danger or being dangerously seductive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and Sean does that. I mean, I would like to own one of those. I mean, they're, we try they're beautiful to, pieces of work. They are. I try to do them cla- cla- well, I try to make sure we do them classy, but at the same time, you know... Sex sells, mm-hmm. and I and I like sex in things like, <laughs> just in general. Like I like Spartacus because there's, there's tons your, of male and female your, nudity. There's, there's your pull quote right like, there. Like there's yes, sex sells, Brubaker. Um, but like <laughs> actually, I was with the I like sex, oh. Brubaker. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, as a genre, I don't, I, I direct all inquiries to five five five. But but I you know I think about that sometimes. I want to make sure that this isn't the kind of thing that a, a woman reader will look at and go, oh, God, your depiction of... That's part of what brought me to Fatal was... See, that's so was rare right now. The, the thing where I felt like... I was talking to another writer about it, and, and she said that she hated that the femme fatale in literature was always just a, a, a genre trope or a plot device and not a character. And I thought, well, how can you make the femme fatale the most interesting character in the story then, where she's actually the hero or she's actually the like the vic- and, and and I was thinking, well, 
imagine if double indemnity, she needed Walter Neff to kill her husband because her husband was going to do a Rosemary's Baby on her. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then it becomes like, oh, wow, she is not just this, you know. Yeah, now, it's, and you, now it's about more than greed. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I just, and I, I, I kind of bought their point and I thought, well, I want to try and do the opposite of that because, and, you know, but also, you know, I love those old covers and it's like, I have tons of women friends who love pictures of Veronica Lake, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's like, there doesn't have to be anything offensive about it. It's not, I'm just we never do you... those giant Greg Land ass in the face, right. covers, <laughs> you know, yeah. like... We, I, we tried to do the same thing on the Five Books of Blood miniseries for the question. I wanted all those covers to be very pulpy covers. And, man, the pushback we got from D.C. was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. They hated it. Yeah. I mean, they hated it. It was... And why was that, do you think? <sighs> why was it? Because they're stupid. <laughs> no, I mean, i got to tell you, I think... <laughs> I think the argument the argument they gave us was it's not superhero enough to which the response was it's not a superhero book. It's not. It's called freaking crime. I mean, I'm talking about the dumbest I again, the a title that they gave me, you know, but it was what, 52 Aftermath, The Crime Bible, The Five Books of Blood. That title is longer than most of the speeches in the book. I yeah. mean, it, it, it was ridiculous. And well, <laughs> and and I just I remember I actually remember Dan saying, "Well, I don't like it because it doesn't tell us what's happening in the book." And I'm like, "It this doesn't need to be page one. Mm-hmm. Well, this needs to be. It, it doesn't have to be literal. You know, the, there was one cover in particular that we went around and around. It was for it was for the second one. It was for Lust. I had there was a specific one of the lesbian pulps, one of the covers that I wanted. And I <laughs> wanted to use it. And I was and it, and it was. It's exactly as described. It's it, it is scantily clad woman in the foreground." And, you know, other women in the background looking at scantily clad women as both, you know, temptation and with, with both, you know, desire and fear. And, and it, it's such a trope. It's like, come on, man, the second lesson is lust. What are we supposed to do for this cover? A guy looking at a stack of money. <laughs> Again, corporate work. A fanboy looking at, looking at Action Comics 1. <laughs> that's greed. Yeah, that's, we, oh, that, but that's both. Um, well, one thing that that came that that we were when we, er, your earlier question, I forgot the reason crime comics became a thing at all, like back in the '40s, was like most comics through from you know the early days of comics to through the war and everything. Superhero comics were the huge. I mean, they were selling millions, and then suddenly post-war. America didn't need those kind of. It just it just fell off. It was like literally they would put this stuff out and it wasn't selling. And at the time, you didn't have comic fans working at these companies. There weren't comic fans because no one had grown up with comics except for newspaper strips. So, what you had was a giant group of businessmen who suddenly, like, were like, "Wait, oh, I'm God, not making money doing? anymore. What are we doing?" And they just started throwing shit at the wall to see what stuck. And horror stuck, and crime stuck, and, and romance, and romance. Kirby, who had created Captain America, created the first romance comic, which mm-hmm. sold millions of. So, like, people tried different things. Whereas at some point, when after superhero comics came back, anytime there'd been an, there'd be an ebb, they never just tried a bunch of different stuff. They they keep just well, we're just doing superheroes wrong, and that that's what kind of drives me a little bit nuts right now. When you look at Marvel and DC each pumping out ninety to one hundred books a month. And then every time I read a review of a crime comic, like I was reading a review of Thief of Thieves, where I was saying it didn't do anything, you know, it was like a, it was a, a positive review that one of the backhanded things in it was saying, it, you know, well, there's a lot of crime comics on the market, and this one didn't really stand out. To, and I'm like, there's four crime comics on the market. <laughs> you review 800 superhero comics, and you never point out that, you know, there's nothing that makes Batman stand apart from Detective. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, it's like... Sudden, it's like there's only room for one or something, and it's like do that with other genres too. But, but uh, it'd be like reviewing Hellboy and pointing, well, you know, Steve Niles does horror comics too, <laughs> you know, and it's like, it, well, it we're just, reviewing Animal Man and saying Steve Niles does horror. Comics yeah, exactly. Too. It's just I think there's there's that's what's always driven me crazy is when superhero comics are not selling as well, which the vast majority of them are not selling what they were three or four years ago. 
stick to the ones that are selling well and start trying all sorts of other crap in your lower mid list stuff. Mm -hmm. Like cancel that stuff. Start doing you know Marvel Crime or DC. Like I wish that they would try something different just to see if it sticks. Well, this audience indicates that there's an audience for this, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look. Ten years ago, we couldn't have filled a room at a crime comics panel, you know. Yeah. And well, we would have had like three people, and they were like, "Where's yeah. Le- where's Layton?" Yeah, exactly. Speaking, speaking of the audience, we have I think about six or seven minutes for audience. <laughs> oh, good lord! <laughs> Sorry, but if, no if, answers. If, if people, <laughs> so maybe to ask your if, questions. Yeah, maybe time for like two questions. But if you do have a question, you could race for the mic. They would they would like you to talk into the mic because it it's being recorded. <laughs> Authorities were called better. to Emerald City Comics. So. Uh, <laughs> Somebody has a question here. That's great. Thank you. We have Phoenix Jones in the back. To no. <laughs> uh, well, he looks serious. <laughs> <laughs> Ask it. Ask oh, it. He's all, he's all noir as he walks up. <laughs> if you're going to do a Gotham Central on the Marvel Universe, where would you personally want to do it? Wow, we actually discussed we this actually, at one point. We, had, we, were, we had an email I wanted, about six months ago. I, I wanted to do Hell's Precinct. <laughs> and Greg was like, it'll never fly because everyone will just compare it to Gotham Central. I'm like, yeah, that's true. So what, what I want to do is... It would be Gotham want... Central, but every, they'd show up every time Daredevil left. And he's always knocking shit over. over. <laughs> <laughs> like, this crime scene is a mess. <laughs> well, no, I mean, we, so... we got a blind superhero. It's all over the tabloids. So, so, what, so, so, then what, so then what we started proposing... Was let, let's see if we can do like that kind of take, you know, that grim and gritty street level take, except with shield agents. So instead of going, we are fighting Galactus, they're like, no, no, we're, you know, we're cleaning up we're, after we're, Galactus. We're cleaning up yeah. after this ever. We're trying to infiltrate this particular aim cell or whatnot. So. There's a death cult that worships Galactus. There you go. Yeah. There you go. It writes itself. It does. <laughs> the problem with the difference between DC and Marvel that made Gotham Central work in a way is. Marvel always has had those little things like Alias and and even in the old days Marvel has always had those weird Yancey Street you know like stuff like that wasn't in DC in in a lot DC was always the reason Batman is scary in Gotham Central is because it's not narrated by Batman no one's scary when you're inside the Batcave with them walking around like drinking tea and talking to Alfred it's like it it ceases to be scary when he shows up at a crime scene well that's that's the take on Punisher now too we've been inside his head for so freaking long you know what he thinks about an omelet yeah I loved your Gotham Central issue of Punisher. Yeah, thank you. I, I was. <laughs> thanks for inviting me. <laughs> I, I brought you to Daredevil. <laughs> did you like our Gotham Central episode of Daredevil, where we got the band back together yeah, for? A cr- was for a, I was like, oh, I should actually have a trial in Daredevil. Greg will do research. <laughs> <laughs> I own a page of that. Actually. Oh yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, that was that was our, our and of our, course that's we've circled that, that's when during the that's that's the moment in the Daredevil run where we beat the snot out of the female character too. So that's true. I showed up for that. that but hey, good. she got to sleep with Matt Murdock la- next. Woo-hoo. Lucky her. <laughs> so basically, we beat her up twice, is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, he's blind. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what was, never. Yeah. <laughs> um, Physically and emotionally. But I remember when we were when we were talking about that, and then I said, "Well, why don't we just do our own version of Gotham?" And then we were like, "Oh, Powers." Yes. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Damn it. <laughs> well, we could come out regularly. Oh, we got one more. Oh, okay. One more. last question. Lady in the fedora. Um, I was wondering if you use any kind of uh, consultants from the um, police department or detectives, or what kind of have you ever had any personal experience with detectives or? How do you get... Other than being a bad, not, not positive one. <laughs> <laughs> Ed refuses to answer on the grounds yeah. that may incriminate him. No, um, no, I, the, the, the statute of limitations is long. run out, you think? You hope. Yeah. Come on, this is the 80s. That's right. <laughs> um, Greg uses a lot. Yeah, I've I have, got... I have used a little bit, but you, you have I've got, tons of resources. I've got a lot of, a lot of people I go to for research, because, and, it, and it came out of the novel work. So, you know, I know there are cops I can contact... I use um, you actually. If yeah, I, I call you, and then, you're like, and then you're like, "Hold on, I'll get you." And then, like the next day, I get an email with the answer from some guy at yeah. the FBI. Um, <laughs> and I know people. He's awesome. So I know people all across, <laughs> you know, and, and multidisciplinary. I also discovered for Alpha, uh, you know, I had like two. It's the only time this has ever happened, uh, which I think is sort of a watershed in the career. There were two different moments during Alpha where I had to put out an open research call because I didn't have answers, and each time. 
the question was answered by a fan who turned out to do the thing professionally or know somebody who did. Oh, yeah. I, I literally had one guy, I had, there's a deaf character in the book, I don't know enough about ASL. I was like, I had to do some ASL research. Turns out the guy who'd been moderating one of my forums online and that I've known for like eight years, said, oh, yeah, my wife's a teacher of the deaf. I'm like, can I talk to her, please? There's another guy. I was like, okay, so I've got to put together, um, I've got to figure out a way to clear this amusement park. We're going to fake a a bioweapons event. Um, I don't know anything really about biological weapon distribution and so on. Can anybody help me with this? Which is a dangerous query to put out yeah. there. Anyway. Yeah. Remember that time you told me not to Google how to, like, poisons or so? Or, or like, I can't remember what it was. I was like, oh, yeah, don't, don't, the guy, the guy don't came Google back. bomb making. Yes. There's yeah. like, certain things. Or do it at the library. Well, I, that's, I, I, even, that's even, yeah, like, look, less the, the running reliable. The running joke at this point, though, is that any time you start to type something and the alarm goes off down in Bethesda, you know, or why not? The next like, thing oh, they primary. do, oh, it's him again. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, phone calls. Ted Straczynski wrote novels, too. No. <laughs> <laughs> Knock it off. I think on that note, we have yeah. to thank our guests. Thank for... you very much for listening and coming. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Great conversation. The filter was off, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Ed Brubaker, Greg Rucka, Ben Saunders, a tremendous talk. And I hope you enjoyed it today on Word Balloon. Later today, I'm going to bring you another episode uh, man, a very interesting history of one of the classic creators of uh, comic books that sometimes gets lost in the mix, and, and it's not right, because his contributions were endless uh, for several decades, and uh, managed to stay employed during uh, the tough times of comics all the way uh, through the uh, 70s, up until 1980, and that's the great Gardner Fox. There's a tremendous new biography about Gardner Fox, and uh, I talked to the comic historian uh, that uh, did it, And I'm looking forward to presenting that to you later today uh, for the week here on Word Balloon. Thanks again for listening today, all brought to you by Aftershock Comics. As I said, if you like crime comics, I think you're going to find a lot that uh, you'll like over at Aftershock. There are tremendous uh, crime comics from people like Garth Ennis, and as I mentioned before, Chris Sabella, um, tremendous Colin Bunn, to name a few. Uh, not to mention the other great uh, creators and uh, concepts that are at Aftershock from people like Phil Hester and Marguerite Bennett and uh, Matthew Klickstein and uh, so many other great uh, creators. Uh, really fun stuff, interesting books, great genre-bending ideas, and uh, tremendous top talent to present it to you each month with new issues. Hell, every week you get a new Aftershock book. And uh, they've got a great lineup over there. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on their books and how to order them through your local shop at aftershockcomics.com. Word Balloon also brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners who are propping me up via Patreon, subscribing to Word Balloon. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, I think you will uh, enjoy, uh, you know, hey, what what I do here at Word Balloon, if you enjoy what I'm doing, uh, boy, I'll tell you, this is early morning. You can kind of tell as my brain gets a little scrambled. Uh, if you'd like to help the cost and subscribe to Word Balloon, you can go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon, or the front page of wordballoon.com has the Patreon ad. Thanks again for listening today. Uh, another great conversation, and as I say about Gardner Fox coming later, probably tonight, but also uh, I'm going to try and squeeze in a couple more episodes before I head to Rose City Comic Con. This week, uh, I will be there uh, Friday through Sunday. I cannot wait. I'm looking forward to seeing my buddies out there, people like Rucka and uh, Matt Fraction and Kelly Sudakonic, of course, Brian Bendis, Jeff Parker. Man, I'm hoping to run into Matt Wagner and uh, Ibrahim Mustafa, my dear friend. Hopefully, Diana Schutz, uh, as I, I mean, Colleen Coover and Paul Tobin, two uh, sweethearts that I uh, really enjoy seeing at, at cons and uh, keep meeting to have on War Balloon. I love their work. And uh, really, I am, I am very fortunate to, to have such a number of great friends in the Portland community. And this is my first trip out to Portland. I can't wait to try Voodoo Donuts, of course, and uh, check out Paul's Bookstore, something that Brian has been teasing me about for, Christ, over 10 years since we've known each other. Cannot wait to check out those haunts in addition to Rose City Comic Con. If you're going and you see me and you might hear my voice, please come up. Let me uh, know that you uh, like Word Balloon. Let me give you a chance to... uh, uh, give me a chance to thank you for listening to Word Balloon and uh, supporting me through listenership throughout these years. Hey, uh, the Word Balloon archive, if you don't already know, is dense. That's why I represent a lot of these uh, episodes. And uh, it seems like uh, since moving to the Spreaker platform, 
a lot of these episodes haven't been downloaded. So, uh, And again, a lot of newcomers here to Word Balloon. Check out the archive at wordballoon.com. You'll find more great episodes and more great conversation uh, through my 14 years of Word Balloon. I'm having a great year in 2019, but I like to every now and then reach back and bring you an extra great conversation from the past like this one. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.